So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this informational webinar about the Betty Irene Moore Fellowship for Nurse Leaders and Innovators. My name is Megan Hansen, and I'm the Communications and Marketing Specialist for the program. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to go over a few Zoom features that we'll be using today. Like most webinars, only the host will be speaking. We will use the chat feature to ask questions. So when you have a question, simply go ahead and type it in the chat. Our team is consolidating the questions and we will review and provide answers at the end of the session. Also, we're recording this webinar and we'll send the recording to you in the next day or so, so you have a copy for your records. We will also be posting a copy of the recording to the website. And now I want to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Heather M. Young, who is the National Program Director for the Fellowship. Take it away, Heather. Thank you so much, Megan, and welcome, everyone. I really appreciate you being here today. I'm so glad you've joined us, and we hope we can answer some of your questions. We're really excited about this opportunity, and we're glad that you've shown interest. I think it's a really op important opportunity as the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has funded to advance nurse leadership in our country. They're very interested in advancing the next generation of leaders and innovators, and that's what we're here to talk about. In today's session, I'll be giving you an overview of the program, the eligibility, the curriculum, and the application process. And as Megan mentioned earlier, please type your questions into the chat, and we'll address those at the end of the formal presentation. We've tried to incorporate a lot of the questions we've heard in previous webinars into our presentation, so we'll see how well we do with answering your questions. So I'll go through the basics of the program, and then we'll entertain the questions. I just want to start off with the vision for the fellowship. This is really um, exciting to me personally. These are the two people that have inspired the work at, at UC Davis and the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing and also the fellowship program. And that's Gordon and Betty Moore. Gordon was the founder of Intel and he invented the semiconductor. He, he changed the world with his inventions and his leadership in the computer science industry. And Betty, his wife, was a caregiver for most of her life. She had parents and uncle that she cared for. She had a, a child who needed some help. And she spent a lot of her time in her life helping others and also interacting with the healthcare system. And that wasn't always as positive as it could have been. And I think she saw herself as a, someone who had a white woman with, with a lot of money and privilege. And even with all of that, not having the access to the kind of care that she thought was ideal. And she imagined, what is it like for other people? And what, how do other families cope? One night, she was in the hospital in, um, in about 20 years ago. And a nurse came in and said, here's your insulin. And she said, I'm not diabetic. And the nurse gave her a very large dose of insulin, um, overriding her objections. And she actually had a, a negative effect from that experience. And the person in the next bed who was supposed to get the insulin also suffered from that event. And it was at that time that she started to think, you know, if nurses, nurses are everywhere, they're in healthcare, and they're doing everything all the time. And if they were equipped with system thinking, that they were thinking about the systems of care rather than just each individual encounter, and if they had the authority in health systems to lead, then I think healthcare would change and it, the quality would improve. And so based on that insight from Betty, um, they really, at the foundation, decided to commit substantial investments to nursing. And it started with an investment in the early 2000s in hospitals in the Bay Area, where they funded 100 hospitals with $100 million to do improvements in quality on nurse-sensitive outcomes. And then they founded the, the Betty I. Remore School of Nursing at UC Davis. And I was privileged to be the founding dean of that school. And we developed a program that really equips people to be leaders in healthcare and also to think through systems kinds, systems level issues and to really advance health and equity. So that program has been going, the school's been open for over a decade now with lots of alumni. And the next big investment that they chose to make was in this fellowship. And this is their chance to do, have a national impact, to invest in the next generation of leaders to accelerate your leadership and your innovation in nursing, and to increase our capacity in our field for leadership with an expanded network and confidence to take our great ideas to fruition. So that's the, the history of our fellowship and how it came about. 
I want to introduce you to some important people that you'll get to know and through this process, and if, you're in, if you become a fellow, you'll really get to know. Um, our national program office, I'm joined by Associate Director Elena Siegel, Janet Hetzbell, who's Associate Director of Operations, Monica Escada, who's the Program Manager, and Kristen Vinatelli, who's on the phone today. She'll be uh, collecting your questions and sharing them with me. Dan Carter, and you already met Megan. So that's our team, and uh, this is an incredibly dedicated team, dedicated to your success. I also want to introduce you to Fellowship National Advisory Council. These are the leaders that are prominent people in, in health and healthcare who come together to advise us. They, they help us with um, the, the, the strategy around the program. They gave a lot of input into the design of the program. And they're also going to be the people reviewing the applications for the program. So they'll be looking at your application. And then several of them are participate in the in-person interviews. So you'll have a chance to meet these, these individuals. All of this information is on our website. So feel free to go if you want to learn more about anyone. Go on to the website and you can see the bios. We have really important partners in this program as well. The UC Davis Graduate School of Management are our partners. Dean Rao Inava is a very close colleague of mine and a wonderful collaborator. And he's brought together a, a whole group of, of faculty who have strong expertise in leadership and innovation. And then we've also engaged other faculty who are not part of the Graduate School of Management to bring additional expertise to inform our curriculum. So a little bit about the fellowship. It's intended for early to mid-career nursing scholars and innovators. That means five to ten years out from your PhD. So that's the frame, that's the time frame. Next year, this year it's from people who graduated between 2012 and 2017. Next year it'll be 2013 to 2018, you get the picture. Um, and, it's a, and the intention is to get people who are in somewhat of the same developmental phase of a nursing career, academic career. And there are some exceptions if someone has had uh, family leave, for example, that's something we can talk about. So I'm happy to, in, in, to have individual conversations if that's an issue. It's a program that includes several elements. There's a curriculum that's leadership and innovation focused. There are mentors who are really important to this process. There's a, there's a project. And we provide $450,000 that it funds your project and also professional development goals that you might have. So maybe some courses you want to take, travel, and those kinds of things. Well, we've met about 10 fellows per year to this fellowship. I want to talk about the program components. There are four main objectives to this program. The first is to really develop a strong understanding of yourself as a leader. That includes where your strengths are and where are there areas you might have blind spots or opportunities for development. We also want to equip you with the skills so that you can actually influence system change. We also build your confidence to take your ideas to fruition and expand your leadership network. So those are the main objectives of the program. And there are activities that go on and that are both group and individual to help you to build these skills. On the group side, we have an annual convocation. It's a week-long commitment in July, the last couple weeks of July. And we'll let you know those dates very shortly. And that's an expected, um, if your attendance is expected at that, it's a week-long uh, uh, convocation. We're hoping next year it will be in person in Sacramento. Last two years we've had to do it on Zoom. It's been really great, but we'd love to see people in, in person. We also offer some online courses that are asynchronous that you might take during the program. We have monthly meetings that are mandatory, two-hour meetings with your cohort and with the National Program Office, and then guest faculty come to that. And then workshops on specific topics that will come at different points in the fellowship. Then there's some individual activities that you'll engage with. You'll develop an individual development plan, and that plan really captures your leadership and innovation goals and includes what the kinds of things you want to do and your activities, your experiences you want to gain during the fellowship. You'll be doing a research project, and I'll give you more detail about that in a moment. And then there's mentorship, and that's when you work with your self-selected mentor and a national mentor that we provide for you from the National Program Office. And then you'll be engaged in your network and expanding your network. So that's the overview of what goes on in the program. A little bit more about our curriculum and activities. Our goal is to really build your capacity in leadership and innovation. As I said, we have the annual convocation in July. 
And then the mentors are really an important part with, of, of this um, work with you. They'll understand your curriculum, what you're doing in the curriculum, and they'll be able to help work along with you as you go. And you'll have regular meetings with them um, according to your needs and according to where you are in your, in your development of your project and your leadership. And then we're hoping that you'll stay engaged as alumni. We want to build a real cohort of people who, are, who know each other and can support each other long after the fellowship. I'm going to turn to eligibility. Uh, there are two kinds of eligibility that are important. The first is institutional eligibility. We have a list of academic nursing programs on our website that are eligible uh, sites for people who are in academic settings. This is a list that we develop every year, and it's something that the, the Fellowship National Advisory Council works with me on, reviewing institutions. And part of what we're wanting to accomplish in, on that list is that the institution has the capacity and the commitment to support your scholarship and to support you being in the fellowship. We also, if someone is in the program from an institution, no one else is eligible from that institution until they complete the program. So our inaugural cohort will be finishing at the end of next year, and at that point, their institutions will be again eligible to submit a fellow a recommendation. The other kind of institutional eligibility is a nurse scientist at a major health system or an organization that has a demonstrated commitment to nursing science, innovation, and leadership. These could be academic health systems, it could be a community-based health system, it could be a public health, pro health system, it could be the Indian Health Service, a variety of different types of institutions and organizations. And if you have questions about your organization, I'm happy to chat with you. Then there's the applicant eligibility. As I mentioned, a PhD conferred between 2012 and 2017. At least one degree in nursing or nursing science. So you could be an RN who has a, a PhD in computer science or a PhD in psychology. You could be a person who's not an RN who has a PhD in nursing science. So the, the key word there is some, some degree somewhere that addresses nursing. You have to commit at least 30% of your efforts starting July 1st, 2022, and commit to attend the annual convocation in July and the online monthly meetings, as well as the mentorship and learning activities. So as you complete your application, you'll have an opportunity to say, yes, I'm committing to this. We want to make sure that people who come into the fellowship are fully available and willing to participate in all of the elements of the fellowship. I'm going to talk about the project. We usually get a lot of questions about that. The big idea with the project is that it must address an important question or develop and test an innovative idea. There are a lot of different ways that projects can be manifested, and we have quite a lot of diversity in our, in our current cohorts of, of fellows. It could be a research study. That's a typical kind of a, a, a proposal. Uh, it's a, you know, with the amount of money of 450000 it's comparable to a, a large R21 or R01 in terms of the size and scope of it. So it's a, it's a research study, and that's, that's one potential, potential way. It could be an evidence-based intervention, but you have to use implementation science because look at the left side of the thing. We want to make sure we're testing and developing an innovative idea, which means that there has to be a scholarly product out of it. So if you're testing an intervention, you need to have um, some scholarship associated with that work where you're actually going to be disseminating the results of that testing. It could also be an invention with a rapid cycle design process, for example. And we're really interested in, in innovation, so to pitch your ideas to us. What you'll see with our application is that the project is not your typical NIH kind of an application in the sense that you, you do your specific aims, your methods, and, and, you, and you, you address it in that very formal way. We're wanting you to really talk about your idea, the impact. What do you, what do you want to change in the world? What's your issue that, you, that you're working on? Why is it important? And what might be some of the ways you approach it? That would be loosely translated as your method. We're not expecting a firm, firm proposal at this point of what you'll actually do. Because in the first six months of the fellowship, you'll refine your ideas and your project proposal is actually due in December after you've been in the program for six months. And the reason we do that is we want you to have the time to use our first, first convocation, the content you learn there. We do some work particularly on human-centered design, so you can think about 
those those approaches as you as you conceptualize your project, and then you also get to work with your mentors to refine your ideas. So the, the pressure for the application is to be visionary about your project, what you'd like to accomplish, and how you might approach it, but not focus as much on the details of how you'll actually execute that project. Mentors. I want to talk about mentors. You're going to self-select some mentors, a, a mentor, and you'll have that as part of your application where your, your mentor will make a statement about working with you, a letter of support, and provide a bio sketch. And you'll be asked, why this mentor? What is this mentor actually going to be contributing and helping you with? They don't have to be from your same institution, and they don't have to be in the, your same discipline. So you can be very creative in deciding your self-selected mentor. You want to make sure it's a person who can really walk with you on this journey, who can be available to you for regular consultation and support and can advise you. They could be someone you've had in the past, but it, you know, it might be a time to switch and get someone new who could give you new innovation and new ideas at this point in your career. You can have a mentorship team. Some fellows identify a couple of mentors when they come in, but you only include one, your primary self-selected mentor on the application. That's the person we'll be working with directly, orienting them to the program, and working with them. You can also include your mentors on your budget as consultants if you would like to, or they might be co-investigators or you don't have to pay them. It really is about how you and your mentor negotiate your relationship. And then after you're in the program, I'll sit down with you individually and talk about, so let's talk about your mentor. What's, what's going on in your mentorship team? What are they helping you with? And what might be missing? What are the kinds of things you might need and want to augment what your self-selected mentor is providing? And then we'll brainstorm some ideas about national mentors that might be appropriate that could help you bring additional expertise, they could maybe connect you to networks you need to enter, they could expand your horizon. So the national mentor is not as intensive a relationship. You're not with them as regularly as a self-selected mentor, but they're important in, in guiding and helping to expand your horizon. The budget, let's talk some money for a while. The total, uh, the total award is a $500,000 award and we give 50,000 to your institution. And that's in lieu of, of direct, indirect. We don't do indirect funds with this grant. So instead of indirect, we'll give 50,000 to the institution as a one-time payment in your first year. In your dean or your, your supervisor, your CNO letter to us, a, a letter of support, they need to say a couple of things. One is that you're available for 30% and they agree to that. But secondly, how would they like to use $50,000? It's highly variable. It depends on the institution. In some cases, the dean has said, I will give it to the scholar, the fellow. They can have it for their project. In other cases, they said, I'd love to have this to be able to share the wealth and to be able to provide research development for other faculty. So I'm going to invest in training and education for other faculty. In some cases, they use it for pilot funding for others. In some cases, they've taken the money to cover infrastructure and overhead costs. In some cases, they've covered the cost of teaching that because the fellow is freed up from teaching, they've covered the expenses of hiring another person to teach a course. So it's really up to your dean or to your CNO about how they use that, and we just need to know what they plan to use the money for. You must include 30% of your time on your budget, and that's so that you can spend approximately 20 to 25% on your project and approximately 5 to 10% of your time on the, on the fellowship activities. You also will identify your project expenditures. And you're probably asking yourself right now, if my project's not finalized, how am I going to know my expenditures? Really good question. We want a draft budget because when you've done your project and you've finalized your plan, you'll revisit your budget, you'll fine tune it, and we'll, we'll, then we'll have a chance to really look to make sure that you have the expenditures in the right place to execute your plan. But the kinds of categories we want you to think about and put in your budget are your personnel, um, your staff that you need for the budget for your for your project, any equipment or supplies or licenses or software, any kinds of consultants you might need or expenses that relate to your data collection and analysis. And then we also want you to include professional development expenditures. So you might want to plan each year to, to travel, to go to conferences, to either um, meet and network, and also I hope to present your, your findings and your, your work. 
so it covers registration fees. Some of the fellows have used the professional development expenditures to, to fund courses that they've wanted to take. So it's really up to you how you spend that money. Now I'm going to turn to elements of successful applications. Everybody wants to know how, you know, how, does, how does someone succeed in getting into the program. It's a very competitive process, and we look at both the individual applications, and then when we have a, a group of, of successful applications that we're very interested in moving forward, we look at the cohort and the mix and, and how this might blend together in a way that will really result in a very positive experience for all the members of the cohort. So there's two, two levels to that application. I would say that the most important elements of, of applications are summarized on the slide, that you really dig deep into your thinking about your own leadership aspirations and your innovation. What do you think you want to do in, in leadership and innovation? Um, what some of the unsuccessful applications say, I really want to be an associate dean for research. That's a role. It's not a leadership activity. It, you have to be a leader to be an associate dean for research, but it's not an aspiration around leadership. You need to talk about things like what changes do you hope to make in the world, in the practice, in your system, in your organization, in the students you teach. What do you want to do as a leader? How do you want to inspire others? What is it that, you, that really is important for you to do in your life's work? So think about that as you write your description of your leadership aspirations. We also are very interested in having a well-developed, big-picture vision for an important health or health care issue. And, and a conversation about how you aspire to address that issue with your project. So identifying what it is you think you want to work on and how your project is going to actually help with the solution to that issue that you've identified. And then the third component that's really important is strong support from your mentor and your home institution. We want to see that your mentor understands you and has complementary expertise that can enrich your, your path and your journey and that your home institution is committed to giving you the time and the potential to continue to grow with them after you complete the fellowship. So here's some tips for you as you go through your application process. It's really important that you get some feedback on this. I think that it's very helpful when you ask others to read your work, because sometimes we have blind spots when we write, and we, see, we, we think we're logical, and someone reads what we say, and it doesn't make sense. So really take the time to ask people that you trust, and it might be your mentor. Definitely, if, you, if you're working with a mentor, have them look at what you're writing. You might want to also reach back into other mentors you've known in your life that, that have been helpful and instrumental to you and ask them to take a look at your leadership aspirations. Practice, practice talking about your vision, about your leadership and your healthcare issue, um, verbally and in writing. If you make it through the, the round where you have, we do the review of your written, you'll be invited for a, an interview that occurs with the National Advisory Council members and National Program Office. It will ask you to tell us about your leadership aspirations and the important healthcare problem that you're trying to address. So practice talking about it and doing it in a succinct manner so that you can answer it in, a, in three to five minutes and have all, all that you want to say in that, in that moment. Think globally about how this fellowship specifically will advance your career. So what about it? Not just I like the, I want to learn about leadership, but what is it about leadership that you want to learn? Are you wanting to improve, improve your communication skills? Are you interested in being able to really become more inspirational in how you in, in inspire your team? What are the kinds of things that you want to actually work on? And then schedule time to talk about your application with your mentor and also with your dean or chief nursing officer because they're going to be writing your letter of support and it's good for them to know what you're up to and what you're thinking about so they can affirm their commitment. So I want to just go through some of the budget questions that I, we've heard in the past and maybe some of them are already in the chat and we'll see if, if, if you're tracking with the other folks who've heard this information before. First question is, should the institutional 50000 be included? You don't include the 50000 in your own budget, but there is that 50000 that needs to be addressed by your dean or CNO. Um, you will, your budget is a $450,000 budget that you need to work on. The self-selected mentors can be compensated. 
and you can bring in co-investigators on your budget. Think about this as you would, as, as, you know, our, our grants, like an R21 or an R01. There are no indirect costs allowed. The 50000 is in lieu of that. You can include professional membership dues. Don't include costs to the convocation. We will pay for anything we ask you to do. So if we ask you to come to Sacramento and stay with us for a week for the convocation, as we do, we'll cover all of those costs from the National Program Office. You don't need to put them in your budget. Can I allocate more than 30% of time to the project? Yes, you can, but you need to justify that. When you write your budget justification, why do you need more time um, in, in, the budget, in the fellowship than, than would be typical? And then the final question is, is the budget final? And no, your budget is not final, but we do want to see how you're intending to spend it in a general way. Once you finalize your proposal in December, you will also submit a final budget at that time, and then we'll approve both the proposal and the budget, and then you're off to run. I'm going to talk some logistics now, practical matters about how to apply. It's a two-part process. The first part is a Qualtrics application and you need to request a link, and many of you have already, I know. But request a link from our website if you haven't. And this gives you a custom save-as-you-go application. So you can fill in the application a little bit and go away and come back and add more. The thing we also offer on the website is a, is a Word document that's a downloadable application that has all of the elements. I strongly recommend you take that and you work off the Word document and then you can get it all fine-tuned and then upload it in one sitting on the Qualtrics. I think that, that cutting pasting it that way has been easier for people. So that's just a piece of advice about doing it that way. Then the second element that's also important, and both have to be completed for, you, for us to think that you have a completed application, is a PDF. And it's a single PDF that has required documents. On the website, it lists those documents. And it includes your CV, your biosketch, your mentor's bio sketch, the letter from your dean, and that whole list of, of materials is there. And you need to put them into the PDF in the order that is specified, and then send it to us by email at the uh, web address right there, and you'll see it on the website as well. So those are the two parts. I want to talk about timeline. Time is ticking. It's November 5th, so um, the, the applications have been open since the end of September. <clears throat> and they're due on December 1st by 5 p.m. Pacific time. So you eat coasters get uh, till 8 p.m. And on the week of the 20, of February 7th, we'll be selecting the uh, applicants for interviews. Between December 1st and February 7th, there's several rounds of reviews. We'll do a review in the National Program Office initially to make sure the applications are complete. The complete ones will be reviewed by FNAC members, and then we'll determine those that go for full review, and then the, the FNAC determines those who come for interviews. The interviews are dates are already set, so February 22nd to 24th, and they're mandatory. They'll be by, by Zoom. You'll be assigned about a, a, a two-hour slot somewhere in those days if you, are success, if you are selected to come for an interview. And so put those, pencil those dates in on your calendar, and then when we call to let you know about the interviews, you would then be asked to, to select a moment, a time in that period so that we could conduct the interviews. Then we deliberate on what we've um, heard in the interviews, and the, the FNAC has a meeting and decides who to nominate for acceptance in the program. And we'll be letting you know between mid to late March about that acceptance. And then each fellow is asked, do you want to come after we accept? Some people's lives have changed and they may not want to accept the offer. So we confirm that everybody has accepted and then we're able to announce the cohort in May. And the program begins in July. And in the last two weeks of July, we'll have our annual convocation. And we'll be letting those dates um, be known very soon. Uh, we're just finalizing our schedule at this time. I just want to introduce you to our fellows who are already in the program, uh, an incredible group of people. Their, per, their, their projects and their interests range from, from birth to death across communities and acute settings, technology world, um, in education, in practice, in, in research, and in health systems. And if you go to our website, you can click on any of our fellows and you can get a little video that will talk about their projects for you and you can get a sense of the kinds of things they're, they're working with. This is our second cohort of fellows. They were admitted this last year. 
And again, it's just an incredible group of people, very, very interesting work, and really representing so many different aspects of health and health care and health equity. Um, feel free to reach out to any of our fellows if you have questions, if you want to know a little bit more about the program experience. We have a couple, Rachel DePazio and, and Kimberly Toussaint, are both in health systems, and the others are in academic setting. We're really wanting to recruit more people from health systems and also from non-academic settings. So um, we're, as, a, as the cohorts go forward, we're hoping we'll have greater representation in those areas as well. So now I'm going to pause, and it's a chance for us to think a little bit, and I'd like to hear from you a little bit about what's going on and what, what your questions might be at this point. Kristen, you may want yes. to um, let me know what's in the chat. You bet. Okay, the first question is an eligibility question. And it yes. says, if there is a current fellow in the program serving as faculty at the School of Medicine, can someone who is working within the service sector, such as nurse management, from the hospital system on a different campus apply? That was a very convoluted question. Thank <laughs> you for asking that. <laughs> We, that we consider health systems and schools of nursing, if, if, it's, if it's one, am I still online? I've, I've lost my connection. Can you hear me still? Yes, we can, we can hear you. you. Okay, good. I think my, my video went down, but I'm still here. So that, it, it, that we consider health systems and, and schools of nursing, if they have the same name at the beginning, like UC Davis Health System, UC Davis School of Nursing, that's considered one entity and only one person at a time can be part of that. But if you have a question that's subtle, please don't hesitate to let me know. You're welcome to just let me know and um, we can talk about your specific situation if it's a really unusual situation. Excellent, thank you so much, Heather. Uh, I have another question about the project, uh, the proposal. When it comes to the proposal section of the application, especially the question about the importance of the issue you propose to address, what are your recommendations about citing existing literature considering the word limit? Sorry, Heather, you're on mute. Hmm. There we go. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry about the, the technical difficulties. Um, very good question. Don't waste your word space on, on the literature citations, but, but use the literature to form your opinions. And, and if you make statements of fact, make sure that they're, that they're supportable, but you don't have to use your word limit to do that. Okay. Uh, I have uh, another question that came in. Um, I am 75% 75, 75 UT School of Nursing and 25% VA. Am I eligible? If you, it, it depends on the campus, the UT, we have someone from UT now. So I think if you have a specific question, would you mind sending me an email, um, send it to the H Nurse Fellows with your specific situation, we're happy to respond to you. I think that would be probably better. I don't want to mis mislead you. Excellent, thank you, Heather. Uh, the next question, how much leadership experience are, are applicants expected to have? That's such a good question as well. You know, I think many of us who are in nursing have been leaders since we were in kindergarten. We were organizing our friends on the playground. Um, leadership doesn't mean formal roles. Leadership is about having passion and inspiration and getting people, influencing people to do things. Some people have had a lot of experience in their communities and the organizations that they belong to in the, or in the community. Some have had experience in, in school, in, in high school or, or earlier. So talk about the kinds of experiences you've had in your life and where you want to go. That's what's important. Um, getting to where you are in your career, you already have demonstrated leadership to get to where you are. So talk about that. Um, so you don't have to have had a formal leadership role, a title, if you will. We, as you can tell by my answer, we really do think of leadership very broadly and very inclusively. It's not only role-based leadership. It's, it's really about how do you influence others to make change. So feel free to address it from that perspective. I have two questions about mentoring and mentorship. 
If we have a mentoring team, where's the best place in the application to describe the team since the primary mentor has its own section? You would say it briefly there in, the, in that mentoring section that you have another person. I would focus primarily on the primary mentor because that's, that's the person that we're going to be engaging with and expecting to guide you. And you can say this, this mentor is also is, 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 um, is supplemented and joined by, and you can list the other people with what their expertise is, but I would just give them a couple of sentences. Um, we do want you to commit to one self-selected mentor as the one you feature in your application. That's not to mean that, that they're worth only one sentence. The others are only worth only one sentence in your life because they are, obviously, when you have a team, there's many things that they bring to you. But pick the one that will be your lead mentor, if you will, as you talk about it in your application. Thank you so much. The next question about mentorship. Okay, I'm going to try and, and, and it's a long one. Uh, this is from somebody who has served a new faculty position in a new institution. Can they select a self-identified mentor from their new institution, even though they don't have prior collaborations to show? Or is it better to identify a self-selected mentor with whom I have successful collaboration for about 10 years? Which of these options do you think is the right choice to make? The right choice to make is the one who's going to help you the most in the fellowship. And you don't have to have prior publications or evidence of working with your mentor. Um, you want to make sure you know them. I think it's really helpful to have a connection that you, that you, at least in this period of the application, you meet with them and you figure out, is this someone I can work with and do they have the kinds of skills that will help me? But you should pick somebody who can really advance you where you are now with your work. Whatever your interests are, the kind of things you want to do with your project and your leadership, find somebody who you think would be the most useful as an advisor, a guide, someone who's a, potentially a role model or who could open doors for you. Don't necessarily go back to the comfort zone of someone who you know has worked well with in the past but may not actually have the skills or perspective for what you're trying to take on now. So pick, it's, it's, it's more about how you, how you talk about your mentor and the match for you and your journey. These questions that we put in the application link to one another. So when you talk about where you're wanting to go with your work and where you want to go as a leader, you tie it together to your mentor about how they're going to actually help you get there as well. How do they, what do they bring that's going to complement the program and complement your project in helping you to develop? Thank you so much. Please go Heather. ahead and add any other questions you might have. I just wanted to let everybody know that Megan provided our email address, hs-nurseleaderfellows at ucdavis.edu. And everyone is welcome to submit eligibility questions or any other questions they might have to that email address and we will respond to you. Thanks, that sounds great. Are there any other questions, Kristen? That is it. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all again so much for joining us today. I hope this was helpful to you. Please don't hesitate to reach out if there's anything that we can do, any, any questions you might have. We're going to send the recording of the session to you for your reference, and please continue to look at the website for updates. And if you haven't yet registered for a, a link for the application, please do so and it'll also be in the follow-up email that you'll be getting. Thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we really hope to see your application. Thank you.